Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today we will solve a couple of problems related to um, vector and scalar fields. Obviously, it's all preparation for um, Maxwell equations. Um, now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website because every lecture, including this one, um, has textual uh, supplement. It's like a textbook basically, so you have parallel video and, and text. Something I explain a little better sometimes, maybe my text explains it a little better. It happens too. Um, there is a prerequisite course on the same website called Math for Teens. Um, uh, something like Calculus and vector algebra are absolutely mandatory to understand whatever we are talking about. So, I do suggest you, if you don't remember certain things, you can always refresh from Math for Teens course on this website. Um, now, everything on the website is completely free. There are no advertisement. Sign on is optional. I mean, it's for certain specific purposes. If you want to supervise the education. Um, other than that, you just do whatever you want uh, on the website, go to anywhere. But it's more important actually to go with the course because the course has menus. They are um, the lectures are in certain logical order, obviously. Like if I'm if I'm presenting certain problems right now, it obviously pr uh, the problems about something which have been just recently um, presented to you. All right, so back to uh, problems. Um, first of all, maybe a couple of very um, uh, important reminders about what we are talking about. We will talk about operators of gradient um, of scalar field, three or two dimensional, depending on, uh, which is basically um, a vector by partial derivatives by corresponding variables, arguments. Sometimes we say nabla f, where nabla is triplet of operators uh, of partial differentiation, d per dx, d per dy, and d per dz. So this is, looks like a multiplication of vector d per dx, d per dy, and d per dz by a scalar f. I mean, it looks like it, so that's why there is such a... Then we're talking about divergence, which is um, uh, about um, the vector field. So if you have a vector field which has three components, fx, fxyz, fy, and fz. Then divergence looks like a scalar product of vector of nabla, which is d per dx, d per dy, and d per dz, times f, which is actually dfx by dx, dfy by dy and dfz by dz. So I'm just reminding something which we have been uh, presenting in the previous lectures. And then there is a curl which is actually looking like a vector product also on the vector field, defined also on the vector field. Um, I don't want to put a big formula, I will actually in one of the problems, but for uh, two arguments, for the two-dimensional, it's uh, actually a very easy thing to do. The curl at every point, um, it's uh, dfy by dx minus dfx by dy. I do remember that. Um, so. The curl on the two-dimensional field actually it's a uh, it's function basically which defined for every point. Well, it's kind of a scalar, but we usually associate a vector perpendicular to the surface of two-dimensional plane. 
it more or less resembles the angular velocity, if you remember. Um, we have something which is angular speed when something is rotating, but then we usually associate the vector along the axis of rotation, which is magnitude of which is equal to angular speed, and we call this vector angular velocity. So this is also, curl is kind of a constant which we associate with a vector perpendicular to this particular uh, uh, two-dimensional surface. In, in three-dimensional, it's a little bit more complex to define, so let's just delay it. Okay, so this is just preamble before we present any kind of a problems. Okay, now let's talk about problems. Problems are relatively easy, and in some cases it's just plain technicality, I would say, manipulating this formula. But in one case, there is something important. Okay, the first one the first problem is easy. Now, you remember in one of the previous um, lectures we have introduced the concept of circulation of the field. Now, circulation of the vector field, um, let's talk about two-dimensional case. So, we have a plane and we have a vector field on this plane, defined, a vector defined at every point. Now. Um, let's say we have certain trajectory from A to B. Well, basically what cir the circulation is an integral of this force by the lengths of these each particular segment where the force is defined. Force is different, right? So in every case, it's different vectors. So we divide it in many, many different cases, uh, different uh, I intervals. And within each interval, we assume that the um, force is the same. So we multiply the vector of force. We, uh, it, we usually use the scalar product, so the projection uh, onto this particular segment. And uh, multiply by the length of the segment, and then we summarize them together. Then we go to the limit when the number of segments is increasing and their length is decreasing. It's basically integration. The only thing is, when we were integrating, let's say, the area under the curve, we divide it in many uh, tiny um, segments, and we multiply the value of the function by this segment, getting the area of this little um, almost rectangular piece, and then summarize them together, then go to a limit. Now, obviously, we assume that the limit exists, and there are certain conditions when it exists, which physicists usually usually don't really I even think about it. But in in any case, this is curvilinear integration, if you wish. Um, so that's how it's basically done. Now, in physical sense, this is basically work. Because whenever I'm multiplying the constant force by the length of the segment during which this force is uh, uh, acting, I will get work. That's the definition of work. So basically, we're trying to find out what kind of work is needed if we move one particular object from here to there. If we know the force, either the force helps us or we go against the force, whatever it is, depending on the, the, the direction. So our work will be positive or negative from our standpoint, based on either we exhort this work or we use the, the, the force to do, to do that for us. But in any case, in, with, with a plus or a, with a minus, it's basically a work, because we have on every particular little segment, which we assume to be straight, the force is directed this way, and the segment is directed this way, so we have a projection of the force by the segment and multiply the projection by the length, which is actually a scalar product of this vector and this vector. We did address this before, and then we introduced the concept of a conservative field. Conservative field is if the work from here to here depends only on endpoints, doesn't really uh, it, it, it's not important how we move, important is from where to where. 
and examples of these conservative fields are gravitation and electrostatic. We are uh, familiar with that. Now, what's interesting is, um, okay, now we are talking about the first problem which I would like to uh, to solve. The problem is, if the field is conservative, two-dimensional field, conservative field, so basically work against the force from A to B depends only on A and B doesn't depend on um, the trajectory. Now my uh, question is, uh, well actually the problem is, curl of two-dimensional conservative field vector field. We have to prove that this is equal to zero. Okay. <coughs> now let's recall how curl was defined in two-dimensional um, field. That was exactly in the same lecture where I introduced the circulation and conservative fields. The curl was defined the following way. If you have um, a point. Let's make some kind of a uh, closed path around this point. We're talking about two-dimensional case. Now, let's just calculate this um, integral around this uh, path, which is uh, circulation. Now, we calculate this, and then we have area of this. So, we divide circulation by area. Then we will start shrinking our um, path around our point to this particular point. Point is x, y. If this ratio has a limit, and in most good cases, smooth functions, etc., etc., it does have a limit. This is called the curl. Now, how can I prove that the curl of two-dimensional conservative field is equal to zero? Well, that's kind of very easy, because if you have this particular property that uh, uh, our mm, uh, work which we perform moving from A to B is uh, independent of the path. So let's just take two points let's say A and B. This is a closed path, right? So moving from A to B this way, we have exactly the same result as moving this way, because it's conservative uh, field. Okay, now what if I will move not from A to B on this particular uh, segment, but from B to A? Well, I will have the same, but with a mi minus sign because the vector of uh, field, uh, vector field is exactly the same, but all these little intervals are in the opposite direction. So I will have the same with a minus sign, which means if I will go circularly, I will get zero. So circulation of conservative field around closed paths from A to A is always equal to zero, which means this is equal to zero, and that's why curl is equal to zero in this case. So for conservative field, any circulation around closed paths is zero, and that's why curl is zero. So that was very easy problem number one. Now, problem number two. Also related to two-dimensional vector field is the following. Um, again, we are considering conservative uh, two-dimensional field. Again, for example, gravitation field or um, electrostatic field. Now, apparently, if you remember from the electricity part of this course, or from anywhere else, um, in both gravitation and uh, electrostatic cases, well, let's talk about gravitation case. 
uh, there is uh, something which is called potential energy. Potential energy. Remember when you're just lifting a stone from the surface of the earth, let's say, it has potential energy. And if you will let it go, it will fall down, converting potential into kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy, when it hits the earth, is basically converted into heat or something else. Now, the concept of potential energy is very interesting. Let's calculate the potential energy. First of all, let's talk about um, defining what is a potential of, let's say, gravitational field. Again, that's something which were addressed before in the corresponding part of this course, but I'll just remind you. If you have a unit of mass, let's say in the C system of um, uh, units, it's one kilogram. The potential of gravitational point at some point, x, y, let's consider my mass is at zero, and the mass is m. Now, what is a potential? Potential is amount of work which um, is supposed to be uh, performed by moving uh, this unit of mass from infinity to point x, y. This is the definition of potential. Now, it's a function of x and y. It's a scalar function. Now, the force which exists at any point x, y depends on the distance from the um, source of gravity, right? Now, let's, for simplicity, use even a one-dimensional case. So we are moving along the x-axis. So this is my x, this is my infinity, and I'm moving from infinity to x. Now, um, the uh, force of gravity is, that's the uh, Newton's law of uh, gravity, divided by square of the distance, right? This is the gravitational constant, this is the mass of the source of gravity. Um, our unit is at point x, so the distance is obviously x, so 1 over x squared, that inverse proportional to square of the distance. We know about that, right? Now, so this is the force. Okay. If this is the force, how can I calculate the work to bring from infinity to the point x my unit uh, uh, mass against this type of a force? Well, obviously we have some small interval from x to x plus delta x. We assume that the force is exactly this. Don't need to access. So this is my interval. So we assume that the force is exactly the same because interval is very small, which means if I will multiply times delta x, I will have work which is supposed to be performed on this particular small piece. And if I will integrate it from infinity to point x, let's use a different variable here, just not to confuse, let's say u. Okay? If I will integrate this, uh, I will have the work, right? Now, what's integral of uh, indefinite integral of 1 over u squared is minus 1 over u. Remember? Because the derivative of 1 over u is minus 1 over u squared, right? So we should not really miss gm. And then we have to put it from infinity to x. So if I put x, I will have minus gm divided by x. If I will have infinity, I will have 0. So, so this is my potential. That's interesting, actually. You see, if this is my potential, I use capital U. The derivative of potential of x 
is equal to function of x, right? Derivative of gm divided by minus gm divided by u is gm divided by u square, or x squared doesn't matter. So, what's interesting is that derivative of the potential is the force. I will use this particular consideration to basically prove. Now, what is gradient? Gradient is a derivative um, of the scalar field by uh, arguments, right? We were just talking this uh, in, in the beginning of this lecture. So my point right now, and this is my second problem, if you have a conservative field, like a gravitation field, two-dimensional, let's talk about two-dimensional, it's easier. If you have a conservative field, then this vector field is vector field. It's a gradient of some scalar field, which is called a potential, which means it's df by dx, comma, df by dy. So I have to prove that for any conservative field, there is some kind of a uh, uh, scalar function of the same two arguments which is the scalar field in the same two-dimensional space, gradient of which, which means a vector of partial derivatives, is equal to this particular vector. I use P and Q instead of Fx and F, uh, F, Fy just for convenience purposes. So P of x, y, it's a projection of vector x onto x-axis, and Q is f, y. Just easier to manipulate. So we have a vector field with components P and Q, x projection and y projection and I would like to find the function f gradient of which is equal to this particular vector and this function is actually called a potential of this vector field now go back to gradient uh, to, to gravity in the case of gravity we were talking about potential being such exactly um, uh, scalar field, because when I was um, uh, taking the derivative of the potential, I got the force. Well, it was one-dimensional case, but it, it just brings me to a certain logical point. What if, now what is a potential? Potential is work for a unit of mass, right? Now, what if I will use the, uh, the, the, the property of this field being conservative, which means the work against this field would be the same regardless of the trajectory. What if I will use this work as my candidate for, uh, for, for such a potential uh, function, or scalar function? Well, let me try. I mean, it's, it's an idea which we have to try. So how can I try it? All right, fine. So let's say I have a point x, y. And I would like to have some work which I have to exhort, or the field has to exhort, by moving into this point from somewhere else. Well, obviously, the easiest point is from the origin of coordinate. And I have to find an easy way to reach this point, because the field is conservative, so I can choose any way and calculate work. So I will choose this way. I'll go this way, and I'll go this way. So this is point um, x0, and this is point 0, y. 
right? So I will choose trajectory from this and then to this and calculate work. Why is it easier? Well, because in this case I can disregard my y component of the vector field and in this way I can disregard my uh, x component. So it's kind of easier. All right, so let's just think about what happens if I will calculate the work. If I'm moving from here to here, my uh, vector uh, field is equal p of x zero. But you know what? I would use again some other arguments so because I will integrate. Let's scale, call it u. So I will take a very small um, interval from u to u plus delta u and the work during this interval is equal to delta u right? the force, well x component of my vector field because it's uh, along this uh, x-axis times the length, force times the length, so that's the work now I will integral it instead of delta I will put d and I will integrate it from 0 to x, right? That's my work on interval a, b. Great. Then I will use my second from b to c. So it's from b, c. It's integral from, now I will integrate by, uh, from, from 0 to the y. My variable of integration I will choose v, let's say. Now I have to really uh, uh, take into consideration only um, a vertical component of my vector field, which is q. So it's q. Now the first component is always x, because I'm always on the uh, abscissa x my uh, um, along the y-axis it will change so I will put v here and dv from 0 to y so sum of these is my work well I've got it what I wanted all I need now is to check if this is really a function a scalar vector gradient of which is equal to my um, initial that's my initial um, vector field, right? that's my force it has an x component and it has a y component now, if I will use this sum and take a gradient of this uh, we have to have this so partial derivative of this by x should be equal to this, and partial de de derivative by y should be equal to this. Well, let's check. I might be wrong, I might be right. <coughs> All right. So partial derivative of sum is sum of partial derivatives. Now, what's interesting is, now integral, if I will have um, partial derivative by x by upper limit of the integral it's basically at this function at, at uh, the, okay, the indefinite integral is p of u0 itself and all I have to do is put limits now, why? Well, consider what, what's derivative. Derivative is, first I have to, of the, now this is a function of x, some kind of a function of x. So I have to put f plus uh, x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x, right? That's, that's what derivative is. 
uh, increment of function divided by increment of argument. What is increment of function from x to pl uh, x plus delta x? Well, the uh, increment of this function is p of x zero times delta x, right? Consider this is, uh, forget about the second argument, it's always zero. So it's function of one argument. And let's say you have a area under this function. This is your u, this is your function. This is from, from zero, from zero to x. Now you increment x plus delta x. And now it's a new integral, so new area. So what's the increment of this whole integral? Well, it's f of x times delta x. So basically integration by, 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 top, uh, uh, by, by top limit of, lim uh, of integration gives you the same function. Then you divide it by delta x, because this is a derivative, so you have to increment the function, which is f at x times delta x, and divide by delta x, so f at, f at x remains. So this is easy. So this is p of um, uh, f Okay, this is p of f0 minus p of 0, 0, something like this, just p of x, p of x. p of x, like this. I don't have to calculate this. It's already definite integral. I don't have to really go to indefinite integrals. Yeah, that's it. It's a function only of x, exactly like this is. So, under integral. Great. Now, derivative again by x of the second of integral from 0 to y q of x v dv. Now, we are differentiating by x, which means y is not involved and v is not involved. So it's basically I can go and change the order. First I have to derivative and then integration. We can change this, uh, the order of differentiation. Why? Because again, integration is by, by v from 0 to y. It has nothing to do with dx, so I can insert dx inside. Great. Now, what is... Okay, I don't need this anymore. What is dq by dx? Okay, that's important, actually. Um, if you remember, again, in the lecture about... Um, circulation and conservative fields and introduction of curl. Um, I had the expression, the differential kind of expression for curl uh, of this field f of x, y, with these components being equal to d um, f y by d x minus d f x by d y. Well, in this case, instead of dy, I'm using q, and instead of fx, I'm using p. And the curl of this field is zero because the field is conservative. That's my first problem, which we started this lecture. Which means the q, dq per dx is equal to dy, dp per dy. So instead of this, I can put G 
<coughs> instead of this I can put integral of 0 to y dp of xy point dy because they are equal the difference is equal to 0 instead of this but instead of y I have to put obviously v in this case dv So I'm using, explicitly using, conservativeness of my field. And that's extremely important. Otherwise, I couldn't really change dq by the x to dp by the y. And what's the result of this? Well, this is differentiation, and this is integration. They are reverse each other, right? So I know that indefinite integral from this is equal to p x v. And now I have to put it in, this is formula. Newton's Leibniz formula. Indefinite integral is equal to pxv. So I just put the limits, which is p of xy minus p of x0. So this is my second integral along the bc. Now if I will add this to this, this is plus b of uh, p of x0, this is minus. So the only thing which is remaining is this. So I have proven that derivative by x, partial derivative by x, from that formula which I had uh, sum of two integrals, w a b plus w b c. So I have proven that partial derivative of this by dx is equal to p of x y. Okay, now, how to prove that partial derivative by dy is equal to q? Exactly the same thing. I can actually leave it to you as your home exercise, if you wish. But it's exactly the same thing, exactly the same manipulation with integrals. So again, I would like to, to add that, forget about the technicality. The idea was that in gravitational and electrostatic field, potential, which we know as being a work, being done uh, on a unit mass or unit of uh, static electricity, to bring it from infinity to some point, this function, potential energy, which you have after that, it's really something which, the, the derivative of which, or partial derivatives by, by each argument, gives you the force, gravitation force or electrostatic force. The, the Newton's law or Coulomb's law. So I'm just using this idea and check if it works. And then everything else is just technicality, manipulation with integrals. So that's very important. And by the way, I was reading a few uh, articles about how to prove that conservative field has um, always some kind of a function, gradient of which is equal to this vector field, and the function is called potential. And they were only manipulating integrals without really talking about where the ideas are coming from. And I didn't really like it. I mean, maybe I didn't find the, 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 the better way. Um, and that's why I, I have decided to approach it this way. I think it's much more natural. You know about something physically, and you know that potential is the source of you can restore the vector field from the potential. And that's what it is. Now, I have a third problem, which is purely technical. And now it's a three-dimensional, but it's easy. Here it is. Um, curl of gradient of some scalar field is equal to zero. Well, in the previous problem we talked about the conservative field being always a gradient of something, which we called potential, right? So this looks like we are talking about conservative field, which is a gradient of this. So the gradient of this scalar function gives vector, so it's a vector field now, and now the curl. So the vector field 
seems to be conservative. And we talked about the conservative field in two-dimensional case. Uh, that's the first problem uh, in today's lecture. And the, the curl is equal to zero because the integral along the path, uh, closed path, was equal to zero. Now, how is it in three-dimensional case? Well, in three-dimensional case, there was already a lecture before which found the expression of this three-dimensional case so if you have a field F, which has three components, Fx, Fy, and Fz, now each of them is function of three arguments now, then the curl of F is equal to, uh, that's kind of difficult, so I put it before, Z by dy minus dFy by dz, that's my first component. Second component, xz, fx by dz minus fz by dx. And the third component, dfy by dx minus dfx by dy. Now that was in one of the previous lectures when I was talking about curl in three-dimensional case. So it has three components. <coughs> now, now we have to use this fact. That this is a gradient of f, which means it's df by dx, df by dy, df by dz. So fx is this, fy is this, and fz is this. That's what it means. So my field is not just as any field, curl of which I'm trying to find out. My field is gradient of some scalar field. And that's why my first co co coordinate is equal to partial derivative of the potential by x. Again, this is a potential. Um, second by y and third by z. Okay, let's. Um, substitute it. So instead of fz I will put df by dz but um, so it's df by dz and now I have to divide, uh, uh, differentiate it by y which means dy dy minus df fy is df by dy but then I have to differentiate it in the again, second, it's a mixed derivative. So that's my first, my first component of the curl. And look at this, they are not different. The only difference is that differentiating first by z and then by d and, and then by y, and here by y and then by d, but it's the same function, x, y, z. And under normal conditions, it doesn't really matter how you differentiate first by x and then by y, or by y and then by z, or first by z and then by y. So that's equal to zero. Exactly the same thing for the second and the third component. Well, that's it. So the curl of gradient is always zero. Because the function, as a result of the gradient, the vector field, is conservative and the curl of conservative field is always zero so if you will take some kind of curl well around any point you can do this circulation and shrink it etc if you will do the curl for any uh, conservative field like for instance gravitation field or electrostatic field you will get curl equal to zero okay and by the way if you have a non-equal to zero curl, it means that the field is not conservative. So it's not like gravitational field. Well, that's it for today. I suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. It's exactly the same thing which I was writing, but probably is in a little bit more orderly and more complete um, fashion. I didn't really um, jump over certain, like saying this is exactly the same. I just put it in writing that this is the same. Well, 
Other than that, you got it. So thanks very much and good luck.